Today, we embark on an epic journey into the world of Marvel, aiming to unravel a question that has sparked debates and curiosity among fans. Who would emerge victorious in a showdown between Hulk and Venom? After merging five files, enduring over 30 hours of printing chaos and assembling 55 pieces, I am now ready to bring this epic battle to life. I begin with Venom, who has significantly more pieces compared to Hulk. We are Venom. Piecing him together is like solving a puzzle. Super satisfying. And painting? We're getting to that fun part in just a sec. I use cement glue to bond all the pieces together. I apply UV resin in order to fix any small seams. Once the resin cures, I use a rotary tool to etch small lines and dents, ensuring the resin surface isn't smooth, but rather mimics the texture of the skin. In my view, the original head was a bit on the small side compared to the body, so I decided to print a larger version. Predictably, this upsized head wasn't a perfect fit, so I had to finesse it with a rotary tool to pare down some excess and achieve a better fit. I applied Milliput Epoxy Putty to fill the not-so-minor gaps that emerged. After attaching all his tentacles, I chose to remove the tongue to simplify painting his mouth and eyes. Once the painting is complete, I can easily glue it back in place. Oh, this sound definitely reminds me of a dentist's office. It's like a dentist's office out there. Why? Once the assembly is complete, it's time to move on to painting. I begin with a black base coat, then apply a dark gray layer for contrast, which will allow the black symbiote tentacles to stand out against the gray skin. In the next step, I am use a cool gray color, focusing on areas where light naturally falls on the black skin. These gray areas gradually adopt a purplish hue, creating striking comic book highlights. After airbrushing, I apply a purple pastel to add depth over the gray sections, emphasizing the comic book style where light transitions into a purple tone. I then use a very dark purple wash, almost black, starting from the bottom and working up to simulate a gradient that grows darker toward the bottom. This technique works very well to show how significantly the pastel shading can be subdued. In the following step, I'll use a fine brush to paint Venom's eyes white and add the spider logo on his chest and back. It proves to be a bit tricky and tedious to navigate the white paint through all the muscular details. After applying three coats of paint, the final result achieves a more uniform appearance. Now I'm moving on to Venom's mouth and teeth. I begin by painting the inside of his mouth with a dark red. This also includes the mouths of his little friends, as well as Venom's tongue. Next, I apply a flesh tone color to his teeth. To achieve a stained effect, I layer on a dark brown stain that's quite transparent, making the teeth appear progressively darker with each layer. I then mix a bit of the base color with some stain to create a slightly darker tone which I used to add highlights to the teeth. In the next step, I used a dark gray pastel to add shading to his eyes and the logo. Ensuring they did not appear overly white, this helped to introduce a level of realism to the piece. Once I reattach his tongue, I dry brush a light pink color inside the mouth and on the tongue to achieve a more natural effect. To shield our venom from accidental scratches, I decided to apply a matte varnish. To achieve a more realistic effect, I applied gloss glaze on all of Venom's tentacles as well as inside his mouth and on his tongue. For the grand finale, it's time to add a bit of drool to Venom's mouth, because what's a terrifying symbiote without some slime? I go with E6000 jewelry and bead glue for that gourmet glisten. After a few oops moments and a bit of a learning curve, I finally nailed it. Let's just say, Venom never looked so drool-worthy. Once Venom is finished, I move on to Hulk. I'll show you a neat little trick here that instantly brings out textures and dimensions. But first, let's start with assembling. Hulk has far fewer parts, so I expect the assembly to be much quicker. However, the gaps between each part turn out to be much larger, and it takes me a while to fill them up with UV resin. Is it just me, or did Hulk bulk up too much and skip a head day? Noticing the imbalance, I decided to make his head bigger with a new print. Of course, a bigger brain means bigger problems, like a gap on his back as wide as the Grand Canyon. So I use the Milliput putty again and start sculpting by patching up Hulk's newly expanded back. Once I attach the legs, I am ready for painting. 
Before I start painting, I apply a single coat of black primer. For the base color, I choose a mid-tone green. Once the entire hulk is painted, it's crucial to seal it to ensure the next two steps work properly. The next step involves using a much darker green to apply shading to all nooks and crannies. The beauty of this is that precision isn't necessary. It's okay if I accidentally add shading to an area I didn't intend to. This step is something I picked up from another fellow creator. I take a little paper towel, fold it up, and use only water. I lightly wet it, not too much, just enough to make it slightly moist and damp. Then I take that paper towel and gently wipe over some areas, slightly removing excess paint to let the underlying textures stand out. It's about highlighting those high points without rubbing too hard. A gentle touch is enough to bring the details through. I do this on various parts of the body, revealing textures that really start to pop. That's why it's crucial to seal the model first, allowing for this technique to work effectively. This approach significantly enhances the model's details. The next step involves moving into highlighting. I applied a bright yellow-green to all the high areas. It's difficult to see the effect with just a single layer, so I build it up with several layers. This approach ensures that if you miss an area, it won't be noticeable. Adding multiple layers makes it unlikely to consistently miss the same spot. By the end, you'll achieve highlights precisely where you intend it. The next thing I do is use the same yellow-green color, but I add even more yellow to it. You have to apply this very lightly, using just a little bit. I focus on just certain high points, such as the pectorals, deltoids, traps, and even the knuckles where light would naturally hit. I apply very subtle highlights to these areas, and you'll see how they start to pop. Once this step is complete, you need to seal it up once more for good measure. It's like putting a protective bubble around your masterpiece, saving it from the dreaded oops scratch or the accidental paintbrush elbow bump. Before I start painting the pants, I cover his body with plastic and use masking tape to ensure the plastic stays in place. To cover any exposed areas, like tears on his pants, I use Children's Silly Putty. It works incredibly well for precise areas, is easy to apply and remove, and leaves no residue afterward. In movies and comics, Hulk's pants switch between blue and violet, but violet is more favored. Now I decided to go with violet because it contrasts more strikingly with Hulk's green skin. For the base color, I chose a mid-tone violet which I generously sprayed all over his pants. For shading, I use the same violet color mixed with black in a 50-50 proportion. For creating highlights, I used the same original violet color, this time combining it equally with white for that perfect 50-50 mix. Additionally, I employ the same soft violet shade for dry brushing across the pant folds, accentuating them and enhancing realism. Once that's done, I simply remove the silly putty. It works really well, and I don't have to do any touch-ups. For painting his nails, I opt for the same flesh tone color used on Venom's teeth. The key here is accuracy in painting. But there's a silver lining. Any slips can easily be corrected by wiping with a damp cloth thanks to the sealed green paint beneath. After getting the nails just right, I apply a green wash to subtly mute the tones. Now moving on to his hair, I'm blending a bit of green into the black paint, shifting its hue to a nuanced green-black. This subtly sets it apart from Venom's blue-black tone. This variation perfectly contrasts with Venom's pure black tentacles and Hulk's hair, which help to enhance the scene. To improve the hair texture, I use a dry brushing method with a basic green shade to add depth and highlights. For consistency, I apply this same green to his eyebrows as well. Despite Hulk's massive head, the real challenge lies in his small eyes, hidden under bushy brows, making precision work tricky. I chose off-white for the eyes, black for the irises, and bright green for the pupils. The transformation is immediate, 
shifting Hulk from sleepy to ready for action. I paint the inside of the mouth with a dark pink, nearing red, carefully avoiding the lips. Next, I use this color as a base for the tongue, mixing in white to lighten and brighten the pink shade. To paint the teeth, I use a bone white color. For a more natural look, I paint each tooth individually, carefully working around the edges until the gap is barely visible to the naked eye. Painting a solid stripe across all the teeth would fill the gaps with paint, making the end result look less realistic. After completing this process, the only thing left for Hulk is to apply a gloss glaze inside his mouth and on his eyes. That's when I consider Hulk finally complete. Now to bring Venom and Hulk together in an epic battle, I need to construct a suitable base that unifies all the elements. I begin with plywood, cutting it into a shape that accommodates all parts of the diorama effectively. To heighten the drama and intrigue of the battle, I opt for Venom to attack Hulk from above. To achieve this, I cut out three pieces of foam and stacked them, creating a pedestal-like structure for Venom. Next, I arrange various pieces of street terrain, complete with pre-built objects such as fire hydrants, a gas tank, pipes, and debris. I use Milliput putty to fill any gaps to ensure seamless integration for all parts. To create a unified ground that seamlessly merges all pieces into a single terrain, I'm using plaster. This is my first experience with this stuff, so I'm learning on the fly and discovering both its advantages and drawbacks as I work. The instructions on the package suggest mixing two parts of plaster with one part of water, which is precisely what I did. The initial batch turns out somewhat mushy, a consistency likely suitable for molding, but less ideal for crafting a dirt terrain. Yet as it started to dry around 20 minutes later, I was finally able to replicate the ground texture of the printed pieces by using a piece of foil. For the next batch, I'm adding almost four times the amount of plaster to water. This ratio significantly improves the texture over the first batch, but the plaster begins to set much faster. I find myself with just a few minutes to shape it before it hardens completely, turning into a solid mass. And let me tell you, it gets pretty messy. To ensure a seamless transition between the plaster and existing pieces, I'm integrating several of Venom's symbiote tentacles, along with various rocks of different sizes. Completing the process, I'm using a rotary tool to eliminate any excess plaster from the base and to smooth out the entire composition, giving it a more natural, rocky appearance. Before I begin painting, I apply black primer to the entire base. To ensure the plaster remains intact and doesn't begin to chip, I add a thick layer of Mod Podge. Once it dries, I'm set to start painting. To begin, I use a dry brush technique across the entire surface, starting with darker shades of gray and gradually moving to lighter ones, followed by layers of dark brown and then dark green. For the prominent concrete section, I'm applying a light gray to enhance its visibility. This same shade is also used on the damaged portions of the pedestal. I apply an even lighter shade to paint the grout between the bricks. I color the bricks with a traditional brick red and, after the paint dries, I apply a dark wash to enhance their realism, avoiding a too pristine look. The diorama features wooden pieces protruding from the ground, requiring painting. I start with a dark brown base layer, then apply light brown dry brushing to accentuate the wood's texture. To give the concrete a more authentic appearance, I'm employing a very light gray to detail the edges, highlighting the natural wear from environmental elements. I'm painting the pipes with dark bronze as the foundational color. To expedite the process, I choose to paint all the pipes and the valve in this uniform shade. Following that, I apply dry brushing with a lighter bronze red to simulate wear. Fire hydrants are traditionally red, but given the abundance of red already in play, I'm opting to introduce new colors. Yellow and blue seem to work well. Painting with yellow can be challenging, requiring multiple layers to achieve a smooth finish. Don't you see? That's why it's so hard. However, airbrushing simplifies the task. Creating a barrier with masking tape takes some time, but it significantly streamlines the painting process. Painting with blue turns out to be a breeze compared to wrestling with yellow so I confidently brush the top part of the fire hydrant. But now, unfortunately, 
I've got a fire hydrant so shiny and new, it might as well be asking for a dog's autograph. Clearly not the look I was going for in a battle-worn diorama. To make it blend in, as if it's seen a few things, I give it a dark wash for that vintage vibe. Then mixing brown and red, I dab on what I call the rust of life onto the hydrant and a gas tank as well. I repaint Venom's symbiote tentacles in black to ensure they pop against the background. Following that, I apply a gloss glaze to give them a more organic appearance. With that step, I declare our stand complete. Now it's time to position our characters in their final spots. Once Venom and Hulk are positioned, the diorama comes alive. However, Hulk appears as if under attack, clashing with the scenario of facing Venom. To resolve this, I decided to add tentacles from Venom to depict an active engagement with Hulk. After cutting up a few pieces of wire, I'm wrapping them with cos clay. This clay is ideal for my project because it retains flexibility after baking, allowing me to bend it into any shape I desire. I'm combining these wires in an effort to mimic the appearance of organic tentacles. Furthermore, I'm crafting miniaturized tentacles using Green Stuff Epoxy Putty. Although this material is somewhat difficult to shape, it produces a convincingly organic look. Most importantly, it remains flexible after hardening, offering me the ability to adjust its positioning as needed. After the clay dries, I paint the tentacles black and give them a shiny coat. Then I attach one end to Venom's chest and bend it to make them look like they're reaching for Hulk, playing around with it until it feels just right. To add to the realism, I created several mini tentacles from Green Stuff and attached them to the ends of the main tentacles, enhancing the lifelike organic quality. Giving those little ones a quick paint job brings the entire assembly into a more convincing organic look. I'm placing extra tentacles I made from Green Stuff at Venom's base and on his body as well. These tentacles are styled to complement the main one that emerges from his chest, ensuring a unified appearance. And there we have it, folks. From a bunch of 3D prints to an epic showdown between Hulk and Venom. And now it's your turn to enjoy the glamour shots. Huge thanks for sticking around and not falling asleep on me. Let me know in the comments what we should tackle next. Thanks for watching and see you next time.